Okay, hello and welcome for part two of our series on cell biology and epigenetics. Epigenetics is kind of exciting because now we see how the environment controls the expression of our genome <coughs> or really influences it. It doesn't completely control what those oncogenes and suppressor genes do. Um, it controls which traits are expressed and creates a lot of variety in our phenotype above and beyond what our genome does. So we're following along in chapter five, which starts on page 96 of our text. If you're using the text, if you're not, that's okay. Um, but it opens with the exciting or maybe tragic story of the Dutch hunger winter, where people who were lucky enough to survive at all survived on about 30% of normal caloric intake. This happened in the Western Netherlands in the winter of 1944 to 1945 as a result of German occupation. And if you do any reading on history of World War II, when the Germans occupied a country, they kind of took over all their resources. They kicked people out of their homes. They took over food production. And when there wasn't enough food, the Nazis got it instead of the citizens of the country. Um, so these people were severely malnourished. Now, study of the descendants of this winter, the babies who were born to women who were pregnant during the Dutch hunger winter had some really interesting findings. Not surprisingly, babies who were malnourished in the last two trimesters of pregnancy, that last, say, four to five months where babies are mostly putting on weight, their organs are formed. They might be maturing and refining, but their biggest job to do at that point is to grow, to put on fat stores, um, to grow their long bones. It's kind of what they're doing. Not surprisingly, these babies were small. They showed evidence of intrauterine growth restriction. Their mothers simply did not have enough calories to sustain their own lives and support the growth of a fetus. So these babies were born very little and they never really caught up. That sensitive period of fetal life where the genes tell the body to grow and to gain their full potential was stunted. Not really that surprising. The fact that they didn't catch up, it is a little bit. Um, <coughs> but they had children that were of normal stature, normal birth weight, although they themselves remained small. Babies, however, who were malnourished during the first trimester of pregnancy, their mothers got pregnant during that Dutch hunger winter, had higher rates of obesity. They were born at normal sizes. So if, say your mom got pregnant in February in that Dutch hunger winter. And by May, the food stores were replenished and you had that six months to grow. You were born a normal sized baby. Something would have turned on that thrifty gene though, because these individuals had higher rates of obesity, diabetes, and other obesity related illness. Again, not surprising. Logically speaking, we could say, okay, something in a critical period of development, switched on a thrifty gene and told these people save every single calorie you can to grow because that's what you need to do um, and use every nutrient you can to survive. That makes sense. What was very surprising to researchers was that these people passed on those higher rates of obesity, diabetes, and other obesity really illnesses to their children and their grandchildren, and I bet there are some great grandchildren now who still have those familial risk factors, even though that risk did not exist in generations prior to that Dutch hunger winter. So what's going on? Did we mutate the genome? Well, no, genome remains the same. What has changed is the epigenome. There is an alteration in the way that your existing genes will express themselves when they come in contact with an environmental trigger. Sometimes these changes, as the Dutch winter hunger winter shows us, can be inherited. Sometimes those modifications to the instructions to the genome, not the genome itself, are inherited. Very fascinating, right? I mean, we always thought nature versus nurture. It was kind of a simple argument. The nature is your genes and nurture is your environment and it is specific to that individual. Not so much. Sometimes your grandparents' exposures to things can be passed on to you. 
It does not result in the changes of DNA sequence. All of the bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, all of those bases are still in the exact same amount, in the exact same order, on the same chromosomes. We're not talking about mutations here. Um, we will talk more about mutations later, but for now, we have an intact genome. Every letter is in the right place. Everything worked in terms of transcription. But some of those genes are switched on or they are switched off. They are expressing themselves and it has nothing to do with the patterns of Mendelian inheritance like dominance or recessive. This has to do with whether those genes express themselves at all. They have been turned off or they have been switched on when they are normally off. It's a change. Epigenome, the word comes from the Greek prefix epi, which means above or on. This is something above and beyond the sequence of DNA that gives instructions to cells to do different things, usually caused by chemical modification. And some of these chemical modifications, not all, are passed from generation to generation. Studying these changes in generations um, is the subject of a lot of different research. Modifications can be caused by environment. I only listed a couple of causes here, but there are many, many environmental changes. What your mom ate when she was pregnant, um, environmental toxins, and that can be anything from exposure to radiation, infectious illness, chemicals, medications, um, you know, exposures to irritants, pollution, even your very own hormones or your mom's hormones during pregnancy, like cortisol, can be uh, the basis for epigenomes. Uh, epigenomic changes, sorry. Um, some concepts to be aware of. How do epigenomic changes influence things? What are the limitations on it? Well, there is a certain amount of developmental plasticity. That genome was meant to be expressed in a number of different ways. So developmental plasticity is the ability of the environment to cause changes. Plastic means change or growth. Um, they cause changes in the phenotype. So this is above and beyond, like I said, recessive genes that are part of your genome, but they don't express themselves. Those genes are or they're not. You could have dominant genes. If you have an epigenomic change, that gene is not is either expressing itself differently or it's not expressing itself when it normally does or it is expressing itself when it normally doesn't. And that's what developmental plasticity is talking about, something that happens during development. There are critical and sensitive periods of development so periods of human development in which changes are more profound, things that an adult could be exposed to um, don't have the same effect as the change that is caused by something that you're exposed to in fetal life. Remember that that embryonic period from day 15 to day 60, the developing embryo is very sensitive to everything because a lot of instructions are being given and a lot of growth is happening a lot of cells are dividing, differentiating. Um, and so that tends to be a very sensitive period of development, but there are sensitive periods of development all the way through the lifespan um, where cells are more or less sensitive to the changes in the environment. Three basic mechanisms of gene activity regulation. We have methylation or demethylation, and this is probably the primary way that genes are told what to do. A methyl group, let's see if I can get a little pointer here. There we go. And I'm going to use pink because I like it. So methyl group is a chemical little structure. Um, and it attaches itself, just like the picture says, to a sequence, certain sequence in DNA. And that is going to tag the DNA and say, okay, usually the purpose of methylation is to repress the activity of that gene. Okay, so that's how methylation works. Demethylation means you take that tag off. So let's get my eraser. I have now demethylated that gene and it will express itself when it's not supposed to or express itself when it didn't before. Methylation and demethylation, by the way, are kind of important when it comes to growth and development. We want bones to stop growing at a certain point, right? You don't want to keep growing or grow bone inappropriately 
like you have with Paget's disease. At some point in adulthood, you want that process to stop. And so maybe those genes are demethylated throughout childhood when the long bones are growing, long bones stop growing, and that methyl tag is attached. So some of that is developmental and it's regulated by um, different genes that sort of know when to, when to call it quits. So that is a normal process in our body. And, you know, if you think about our 25,000 genes at any given point, we may have lots and lots of methyl tags all over our genome. Um, histone proteins, that has to do with these little histones. If you remember our lecture from week two, when we talked about the structure of the chromosome. We said that they have to stay neat and tidy because when it's time for that cell to reproduce, we want to make sure that none of that DNA has unraveled. I had two bundles of yarn. One was tied very neatly together with a little ribbon and it was all wound very tightly into a skein. The other was kind of tangled up. The purpose of a histone protein is to keep things neat and tidy. What it can also do is hide the genes that are closer to that histone protein. So the outer layer expresses itself, expresses its traits, and the inner layer is kind of hidden and can't express itself. And then we have microRNA. Um, and microRNA is a type of RNA that binds to the other type of RNA. You might be more familiar with messenger RNA. That's what actually causes the protein, the amino acids in a protein to assemble and create that special protein that that gene codes for. MicroRNA will bind to the messenger RNA and stop the protein. So the gene is still expressing itself, but somewhere along that line, the microRNA kind of puts that messenger RNA under arrest and the protein is not produced. Whether that protein is a hormone or whether that protein is an enzyme or a cell, uh, cell wall, whatever that protein coded for, it's not going to be expressed. And that is function microRNA. Methylation, as I said, is the subject of a lot of research. And it's important research because there are a lot of treatments that may rely on methylation or demethylation to cure disease. It's an addition of a chemical tag. We just saw that in the picture. It turns off gene expression and it silences genes from one parent, sometimes genes from both parents. It just depends on where that methyl tag is placed. Sometimes these methyl tags sort of disappear when the cell divides, either during mitosis to reproduce a new cell or during meiosis when it's a sex cell and we want characteristics passed on that have been silenced. Sometimes they don't, sometimes they last like those babies in the Dutch hunger winter who passed on that methyl tag to their grandchildren and their great grandchildren. Um, so that's methylations, you know, sort of an important area. Histone modification, histone proteins, like I said, they keep everything neat and tidy. There are little chemical tags that attach to the tails of the histones and tell it how tight to wrap. When the DNA is packaged very tightly, some sequences are not available for transcription. They're hidden. So only the sequences on the outside are expressing their traits. And that's all very tightly regulated by things that are much more complex than you need to know for this course. But that is sort of my internal picture of how a histone works. When I go to sew something, um, I have to wind a bobbin to make the bottom thread come up. When I wind it, there's thread on the outside and that's what my sewing machine picks up and uses to thread the machine and create stitches. That's the thread that I'm going to see in my stitching. The thread on the inside close to the middle of that, let's see, can we, yeah. So closer to the inside, all that thread's hidden. So if this thread were like to change color, you would only see the stitching in the color of the outside thread, right? So that's sort of like histone modification. It's the same principle. The chromosomes are wrapped really tightly around these little histone proteins and they unwind when they need to, but only the ones on the outside are really picked up and used to make proteins. And here it is in a more scientific fashion that is not from my sewing machine, but it's the same principle. You have a little chemical tag here, tells it how tight to wind. 
Sometimes you want histones that are wound very tightly, only have a few genes on the outside. Sometimes you want them wound a little more loosely. If those histone proteins get loosened by any environmental mechanism, different genes are going to be exposed. Different genes are going to express their traits. Um, so environmental factors play a role by placing these little chemical tags and making some DNA accessible and some DNA inaccessible. And then there's microRNA. This is probably the least understood aspect of epigenomics, and there may be other mechanisms for epigenomic change. But microRNA are these little pieces of RNA. They're about 20 to 30 bases long, so they only cover a little bit of material. What they do, messenger RNA is the RNA that matches the DNA, right? The only difference in RNA and DNA is that uracil replaces thymine. And that's important because thymine can't leave the nucleus of the cell, but uracil can. So the micro, -R I mean, the messenger RNA goes out and it tells the amino acids how to file up and make a particular protein. And remember, order is important. So the micro RNA matches that RNA and prevents it from coding for the protein. So here you have a gene that's still expressing its trait still telling the RNA to go out and make a protein, but microRNA comes along, binds to the messenger RNA, and makes it useless, like puts it under arrest. So that protein is not produced. All right, that was about the simplest way that I could phrase that. Don't make it too complicated. And we are going to stop here, pick up with a new video. Um, that discusses other means of epigenomic change and what those, what the significance of epigenomics is to you as a nurse.